Joining me now, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, former Chief of Staff to then Secretary of State uh, Colin Powell. And, and Colonel, you're, you're someone who has navigated the halls of power in Washington, D.C., uh, kind of understands both the sort of explicit rules and the unwritten ones. And I'm just curious your, re your reaction to reading what Comey has laid out. Chris, my reaction to what Comey wrote for his uh, prepared statement for his hearing tomorrow and what the senator from Hawaii said earlier uh, are almost diametrically opposed. I'm not stunned at all. I know the senator was speaking for political impact as well as other things, but I'm not stunned at all because this seems to be, indeed, probably is the nature of the Trump administration. It's like a mafia family. And what Comey's testimony, prepared testimony, read like to me was someone from the outside with some integrity commenting on the nature of a mafia family. I mean, that's essentially the way I view President Trump now, as the godfather, as the member that orchestrates everything within his team and expects loyalty, honest or otherwise. Um, it just seems like that's the way it is, and it's going to take a while for my political party because they think, as the other spokesman just said, they're going to accomplish all these goals while this guy is running around the White House because he's a Republican. It's going to take a while for them to realize that they aren't going to accomplish a thing, that what they're doing is hurting this country. You know, I, I want to ask you about that characterization. Do you ever, I mean, you, you worked in the Bush administration and you've been around other politicians and, and leaders in Washington. The, the kind of way in which the president is, is approaching Comey here, and we now have multiple reporting about having everyone leave the room and the one-on-one -on -one ask, is that the kind of thing you're familiar with? Is this, or is this distinctly different kinds of norms of behavior? Well, of course, I've seen, I won't say I've seen the same thing, but I've seen similar activities and, and taken some uh, umbrage about them myself. I've also been involved in activities like that. For example, one of the places in Comey's written statement that I, I took some exception, but I had to kind of check my own shame <laughs> in that regard, was when he said honest loyalty, because that's essentially what I provided for Colin Powell when I prepared him for the 5 February 2000. Hmm three presentation at the United Nations. So I've seen these kinds of situations before, but this one is bizarre enough and yet in character enough that it makes me deeply concerned for the integrity of the White House, the integrity of our institutional process, and ultimately uh, the, the danger it presents to this country, because this is going to happen again and again and again, and, and probably in far more serious situations than the one we're talking about now. What do you make of the defense that Congressman Rooney uh, sort of offered, and I've seen, I've seen other people offer a variation, which is basically this. The president is acculturated to New York real estate and deal making. Uh, it doesn't have the same etiquette, uh, basically, of Washington, and he just doesn't understand what he's doing. He doesn't know where the lines are. Maybe he's a little clumsy, but cut him some slack. Well, I think there's some truth to that. I think his gross inexperience uh, reflects that. But I also think there are institutional webbing, there is institutional webbing around him. Everything from the Attorney General to the whole Department of Justice to all the other departments within the interagency group. And he ignores them. He pays no attention to them. He does policy by tweet. Um, this is absurd and it's dangerous, as I indicated before. The institutional checks and balances can't operate on an individual except in a draconian way, like Article II impeachment, uh, if he's operating in this sort of inexperienced and yet drive-ahead way. Well, so I, I take that characterization as probably accurate, but it needs to change, and it needed to change the day he raised his hand and took the oath. Well, so then what is, I mean, it's, it, you make a great point here that the, that the, the recourse here, draconian, extreme, Article II impeachment, people have talked about our, uh, the 25th Amendment, I mean, really extreme constitutional procedures to attempt to bring to bear the kind of institutional norms. It, is there anything short of that? There's, there's the institutional check itself, which is already happening. I'm watching it happening from the State Department, where our ambassador in London had to sort of modify the president's impact with his tweets about the mayor of London, to our ambassador in Qatar, who had to, ha ha had to make some remarks today about the president's really uh, inept tweets with regard to the situation, very dangerous situation, I might add, mm -hmm. between Qatar, the Saudi Arabia, the other members of the GCC, and so forth. So yes, there are some institutional checks and balances. 
balances that ought to wrap him up and keep him from do, doing more dangerous things. Let me say this, though. I think our founding fathers would have thought that they afforded us in the Article II impeachment clause the ability to throw some scurrilous dude out about every generation. And I think every one of them, every single one of them would be utterly surprised that we have not done so and that on most attempts to impeach, we have been rather feckless, Bill Clinton, Andrew Johnson. And the only successful one we've had was when the articles of impeachment were so strong against Richard Nixon, he chose to resign. I don't think it's catastrophic for the country to take that action. I think it's healthy for the country to take that action. Um, I, I want to ask your reaction to this, this, this finally, again, because of your experience sort of mitigating and negotiating these different power centers. This is um, Comey pleading with Jeff Sessions, basically, do not leave me alone in the room with the president of the United States. He says, I took the opportunity to implore the attorney general to prevent any future direct communication between the president and me. I told the AG that what had just happened, him being asked to leave while the FBI director reports the AG remained behind, was inappropriate should never happen. He did not reply. It seems that Sessions at some level is somewhat implicated in the kind of unraveling of these norms you're talking about as well. I think so. I think that's an extraordinary display of cowardice, a cowardice in the face of his duty and cowardice in the face of leading his subordinates the way he should. I'm reminded of Dwight Eisenhower's statement, as a matter of fact, uh, apocryphal or not. I don't think it was. I think it was accurate. I think Andy Goodpaster and others have verified it. When, when Eisenhower had figured out how dangerous a man Alan Dulles was about the seventh or eighth year of his presidency, he said, don't ever leave me alone in the office <laughs> with that man. Uh, that's the kind of that's thing that Comey was quote. telling Sessions, and <laughs> Sessions just ignored him, just ignored him. All right, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, it's always a pleasure to have your time. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me, or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.